Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of In the Barn. I'm Robin. And I'm Kelsey. And in today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at the reason why riders fall on cross country and one of the biggest efforts being undertaken to promote safety on course, frangible pins. Do frangible pins and the researched fall risks on course overlap? It'd be a fun idea to talk about frangible pins in this episode as well as why riders fall. I think frangible pins right now are getting so much attention all over the all over the United States. I think they're also getting a lot of attention globally. I'm not super sure about that. I'm not really into the global scene. They actually originally started popping up in the UK. UK is really where we saw frangible pins beginning to develop from. And then the US was like, hey, we, we'd like to get in on that. We like, <laughs> we want what you got. Yeah, that, ma- that, 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 that matches with how, where the research also started. So the UK has done a lot of fall research. And actually the FEI, which we'll get through, has really sort of excluded the United States from a lot of fall research. And I don't know why. Like, it's just a weird, like, they've really focused on looking at England and a lot of countries and, like, specifically avoiding the U.S., forgetting the U.S. Like, U.S. fall data is included in a lot of this information I'm going to talk about. But, like, they avoided talking and interviewing a lot of U.S. people and it chose people from other teams in other countries. Really? Yeah. And I don't really know why. But but good news, only 8% of for or riders that are riding at the FEI level in eventing, so one of the stars, only 8% of U.S. riders fall off. So we're one of the better countries with a better safety risk or like safety score. That's weird. I also noticed though when I was looking into like the frangible technology and kind of where they got their start and stuff was they sought out research laboratories in the UK. Like they didn't su- seek out anybody in the US really for it, which I thought was really interesting. And they su- sought out like some Swedish manufacturers and like very much so people that were not in the US. It's interesting because when we talked about helmets, Sweden and the UK seem to be the leading helmet safety technology. So I don't know if there's a trend there. And obviously the FEI is a global organization. They can like contact whoever they want to. It's not a U.S. organization. So them not favoring the U.S. isn't weird. And I think their office isn't, it's in some country or some city that starts with an L. And I didn't look up where that country was. But it starts in a weird, it looks like they're trying to spell Louisiana, but they spelled it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what city that is. Does anyone know? Like if you're spelling Louisiana, but you forget all the letters and just have an L. <laughs> that's so many words out there. That's 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 what I'm recalling right now. Okay. But anyways, so for my research, I kind of wanted to look at a timeline of falls and our fall data. I thought that might be an interesting way since we know there's been a lot of changes to the format of cross country, to the type of jumps, to the tech technical aspect of cross country and to the breeds of horses that we've been seeing that I thought it'd be interesting to look and see if there was any changes sort of over the historic research period because research really didn't start into falls until the late 90s which we'll get into in just a second I promise but up until the late 90s for some reason eventing really no one questioned whether it was safe or not like it was just another sport and I think that's really like surprising because you see a lot of videos from like the 60s and 70s and 80s and you're like how did no one think this was dangerous like how did no one think like this may be not the best idea in the world was it the thing like you would break your arm or dislocate your shoulder and just like hop back on and continue like I've watched International Velvet I that was a thing right so like I don't really understand was it really that much safer or were people just not noticing it as much were horses more disposable like were the, what were the factors honestly I would attribute it a lot to even back then I know like it wasn't to the level it is today but the access to media and being able to share this information across a broader spectrum of people has allowed it to become a lot more obvious where dangers have been present and when falls have happened, like drastic dramatic falls. Because previously, probably in the 90s, you weren't really aware of someone that got hurt or killed in Australia. Today, we definitely know what happens. Like today, we're very much so aware of falls and accidents that take place in other countries and are putting it all together that like, hey, this as a whole is happening. That's true. I also think 
the Olympics play a huge factor in it and the ability to broadcast yeah. that worldwide. Speaking of Olympics, I'm going to start with the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. So this was not, this is a little bit early. This kind of predates the fall research that came at the end of the decade. But it was sort of an important Olympics as far as cross country and eventing was concerned because this Olympics really started to raise concerns over how cross country was handled at the Olympics. This was really not only did it require a lot of space, but it was kind of the first time people realized that cross country was difficult for the horses. At the Barcelona Olympics, which of course this was the Summer Olympics, they were running on a hot day that was very humid. The humidity index was pretty much at the peak red danger level. They were running in the middle of the day doing a long format. The ground conditions were really poor. Many of the horses ended up being basically physically and thermally exhausted. So they were overheating on course and no one really knew what to do with these horses when they got done with cross country. Like these were horses that suffered heat exhaustion uh, and many complications well after the Olympics. And this issue was widely broadcasted. So this issue with cross country, while it had nothing to do with falls, it became widely known. At the exact same time, everybody and their uncle was starting to watch the Olympics on TV. But in 1999, that was the year that sort of changed it for the eventing world. So helmets had been added to the market. Pony Club had required safety standards for helmets in the late 80s. And so helmets meeting some sort of safety standards had just come on to the market in 1999. But there wasn't still a ton. You had body protectors, but you didn't have air vests. You didn't have have a lot of safety precautions. But I think courses were starting to probably get a little bit more technical. But in 1999, there were six rider deaths on course within a few month period. Five of those deaths happened in England and one happened in Australia. Five were the results of rotational falls. And these stories were in the newspaper. They were, you know, published by the media and they were circulated and it was at a really bad time because 2000 was the Olympics. One of the riders that died was actually an Olympic contender. There was a lot of pressure on the FEI at that moment to start making the sport safer and to figure out how to avoid having riders fall and die at the Olympics. We talked about this in one of our earlier episodes about leveling up and what the stars mean, where we did talk about how the Olympics continue to this day to be pushing the FEI to change eventing. So in 2000, the FEI started to look into research to try to address this. So I think they funded a number of studies. They probably did an audit as well. I didn't find the audit, but I did come across one of their original studies that they funded. Uh, This study was called The Risk of Horse and Rider Partnership Falling on the Cross-Country Phase of Eventing Competitions. So what this uh, group did, so this was a group based in England, they ended up going to like 16 different events that occurred in between 2001 and 2002. They went to these uh, events. They collected a bunch of data about each fence on cross country before the courses. And then they documented who fell. So I think they had 173 riders that fell. And those were their cases they looked at. And then they had 503 riders that didn't fall. So that was their control group. And they ended up doing follow-up interviews and phone calls to try to get some information from these riders. And then they basically plugged. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, they, they, they could have asked some better questions, but like... That's okay. (laughs) But they, so they did these like follow up interviews with them and then they collected a bunch of variables that they put into their stats equations and determined where the biggest risk on course was, where the least risk was, those sort of things. So it should be pointed out that in the 2001, 2002, a lot of these events were still doing the long format of cross country. So that extended endurance phase with the roads and the tracks and the steeplechase and then the cross country. And I just think that's interesting because I don't know if that looking at the available data has had no impact on the risk to uh, falls. Like, I think we're falling more, but I don't know 
that the risk of where we're falling, I'll give I'll give the punchline away. It hasn't really changed at all since 1999. We're still falling at the same things. I'll point that out now. So some of the variables they looked at when looking at the fences included ground conditions. So they made an assessment if the ground was determined to meet uh, the following conditions, if they were firm, if it was good firm, good, good soft, soft, and heavy. They had a whole analysis. It was like, could you cook, kick your foot into it? Could you make an impression? They had like a whole technical analysis <laughs> for how to determine type of footing. Then they documented if fences had drop landings. They also documented if fences were angled or non-angled. Uh, the spread of the fence was something else that they documented. And then they followed up with each rider that fell off and the riders that didn't fall off via that phone interview. So the results were that 3.5 falls occurred for every 10,000 jumping efforts. So out of all the jumping efforts at all the levels, 3.5 falls occurred per 10,000. That went up to 9.5 falls per 10,000 jumps at three-day events versus a one-day or a two-day. So there's a less chance of falling at a one-day or a two-day event compared to a three-day event. That is interesting because I would always think that at a one-day it I always imagine my horse is going to be a lot tired or a lot more exhausted out of one day because you're going, going, going. But I also wonder if there's a different level of difficulty designed into these various courses if it's a one day or a three day, right? I think that absolutely is a factor. And we'll see this with many of the tests or many of these analysis is there is a higher risk of falling at a four star event than there is at a novice level event. So for example, you in their findings, it was zero falls per 10,000 jumps for a novice two day event. Compare that to 15 falls per 10,000 jumps at a four star three day event. So you are more likely to fall off at a four star, but there's a catch to that, that this study really didn't get into that another one I'm gonna talk about does get into it because you're more likely to fall off at a four star. And I think that has to do with the technicality and the course designers. I'm not blaming the course designers, though FEI might be, um, I'm not. <laughs> but uh, yes, FEI is tracking course designers, but it's really not a great source of information, course designers, because there's so few course designers that like, you can't really track a bad one because they're like, all cause, causing falls kind of thing. Like it's not one versus the other. There's just so few of them. So one of the other big factors they found was that the surface area of the fence had a big impact on the fall. So fences that were jumped into or out of water were associated with a high risk of horse fall compared to uh, jumps that had firm or good to firm takeoff or landing. The other big one was jumps that had a base spread over two meters. So something that was greater than like six feet wide also increased their likelihood of falling. Well, that makes sense. It does. Yeah. So the number one rip jump that knocks horse and rider over is tables. Number one, like by a landslide. However, and again, we'll get to it, not the most dangerous. You're likely to survive a table fall. Not rotational. You're not having rotational falls at tables. You are just like falling off at tables a lot, which is like tables are my favorite. That's the one jump I can do just fine. <laughs> and then riders who knew they were currently in the lead of the competition going into cross country phase were also more likely to fall. Riders that were using an appropriate amount of speed, so either too fast or too slow, were likely to fall. And riders who had see received cross country lessons were also more likely to fall. I think this one's oh. interesting because this was one of the ones where like you could have just asked the phone call, like on the phone call, you had them, they were live. It wasn't like a fill in a survey, but they hy hypothesized that this could be for one of two reasons. Those taking lessons saw that they had a weakness on cross country and wanted that instruction to improve their weakness or those taking lessons could have been competitive riders and kind of maybe been more in that leader position. And they were taking cross country lessons so that they had an edge and could out could outperform other riders. So that's one of those, like you couldn't have just asked that on the phone. You couldn't, couldn't have done that. <laughs> of all the riders interviewed, 46% took cross country lessons, 94% took dressage lessons, and 86% took show jumping lessons. Yeah, that seems about right. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting that like, yeah, we really don't specialize in cross country. And I think this is one of my like 
takeaways for my conclusion thoughts is that there is this big belief for so long and it was a belief that I've had many riding instructors tell me that was like if your horse can do a ditch if your horse can do a bank you know go through water then you don't need to school cross country that like if your horse can do the pieces you don't need to over school cross country you need more dressage more arena work and less cross country and I think this leads to issues if you're not able to think through what's going on then you're more likely to crash. The ability to think on course. Thinking is, I think, one of the biggest things that if you're stressed out and you're just riding around, you don't have the ability to process all the little information. It's one of the number one reasons pilots crash planes. They make seven mistakes before they crash the plane and die. Seven little mistakes before they crash the plane. And I think that's the same thing on cross country. That you've, it's not just one little thing. Like you got to the start box late. You, you know, started too slow and you have to make up speed. You ticked one fence and you know what I mean? Like it's all these little things and then you fall. Yeah, it all compounds onto each other. Yes. From that study or from that study and probably a few other studies, again, I didn't have all the research FEI did into this early 2000, 2001, 2002 look at the risks on course. FEI decided to invest in frangible pin technology, which you're going to talk about, but I'm going to finish going through why riders fall first. But this I thought was interesting that that study, along with others, I'm sure, prompted the FEI to be like frangible pins. Because that's not what I'm taking away from that study, that like we need jumps that fall or deforming fences. That's not what I'm taking away from that study. So I just want to go through a couple quick research studies before I get to the big FEI audit of cross country. But the, because that I think is really interesting, but I do want to kind of touch on what else was happening at that time. So a 2003 study published titled a retrospective case control study of horse falls in the sport of horse trials and three-day eventing. They again kind of did something similar where they took a bunch of variables from the course, different types of jumps, different information about riders, sort of put it out into their numbers. And the conclusion, conclusion they took from these all these shows and all these falls was that the relationship had a lot to do with how long the course was. So the increasing number of jumps on course meant that more riders were falling. This is specifically tied to those upper level events and those star events that the more jumps you have on course past a certain point, the more likely you are to fall. There is like a wiggle room in the middle where if you're between this certain number, and no, I don't know what that exact number is, so sorry guys, but like there's an okay green light area where like if you're in this range, you're fine, but if you're above this, you're more likely to fall. So they also associated things like a later cross country start time meant that you were less likely to fall. And they found that amateur event riders were approximately 20 times more likely to fall than professional riders. Which is kind of something that FBI found. That's what I'm hinting at, was hinting at with at four-star events, why you're more likely to fall at a four-star event. So another study, which was in, looked at data between 2011 and 2014, was called, titled Profiling Fallers in National Eventing Competitions. So this is a little bit different, as a lot of the events I've been previously talking about were looking at international, which were FEI or star horse shows where this is looking at a national event so you know up through prelim basically so some of the things that they really focused on was that type of partnership so they again were finding that amateurs were a lot more likely to fall and that a lot of it had was based off of how that relationship was set up so you were you had a 40 percent chance of falling if you were upgrading horses so you had gotten a new horse that are moving up a level 25 percent chance of falling if it was a rider moving up so 40 percent chance for a horse moving up and 25 percent chance for a rider moving up so they also had a lot of information about like riders who had started on new horses they're different um like if they were juniors versus amateur versus professional. So what they were finding, though, was a lot of that was based on how new you and that horse were, the more likely you were to fall. Sorry, when you're saying fall, are you meaning, is it like horse and rider fall or is it just rider fall or is it counting both as a fall? So I think it's going to depend on the study and I do apologize for that. So most of these studies are looking at horse fall specifically. And you'll have to like read through the data. This one, the Ireland one, is looking at rider fall and horse fall. I'm sorry, that one is, because they're lumping everything together, only the FEI one really 
started to pull them apart actually everything else was just fall 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 and rotational fall was kind of looked at but it wasn't the fei study was the only one that really looked at rotational falls specifically everyone else was, was just looking at how do we keep people from falling off and the theory behind that is if you don't fall off you don't get hurt and you don't die i think it's a good one i think it's solid <laughs> well i think that's honestly where some of this confusion around, I don't know, like this various rule changes where people are confused as to why FBI and different organizations are focusing on one area versus other areas. It's just this kind of confusion of lumping all falls together and not really separating them and specifying, is it a horse and rider fall? Is it just a rider fall? Is it a rotational fall? You know? Right. And I think that's where we're going to start to see. So I am at the point where I'm ready to talk about the FBI audit. And they do pull it out and they do give factors that lead specifically to rotational falls versus just a fall. And that's a fall of horse and or rider and the other situations. I did should have pointed out in the very beginning, which I forgot to. In 1999, there was uh, a rule about how a refusal was defined. It used to be as long as you didn't go backwards, it wasn't considered a refusal. And that was like the first, that was the real big issue in 1999 was these were riders who had stopped and were trying to get horses to jump from a standstill. So that rule was quickly, FEI realized that doesn't work. <laughs> like we have to get rid of that. In 2015, Charles Barnett was hired and he was hired to do an audit looking into the safety of eventing. So... Charles Barnett was instructed by the president of the FEI to assess the ways in which the risks associated with falls on cross-country phase of eventing could be minimized. He did a huge in-depth look. Again, he took all the fall data FEI had collected up to that point. He analyzed that. A lot of the information they were getting from these horse shows and jump judges who were submitting. There's like a whole sheet you fill out. There's a bunch of information. He did a ton of interviews. He interviewed riders, senior and top riders who had competed at the World Games, the Olympics at, for UK, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Colombia, Uruguay. Uruguay does not have the best record. You are likely to fall off on cross country in Uruguay. Just <laughs> gonna throw that out there. I know you guys are wondering, Uruguay, you gotta be careful. <laughs> so this was one of the times where I was like, it's interesting that they're not talking to United States riders. They even even interviewed TV producers and other media figures, but didn't specify like who, like which TV producers, like which ones specifically. Um, and then they did talk to representatives of the nat of National Federation, so like USEA. They did talk to those members of United in the United States, uh, Brazil, UK, Germany, Belarus, Russia, France, and Canada. But that was the only mention of talking to people from the United States was when they talked to USEA, which is fine. FEI is a global organization. I just think it is as an American I think it's odd we also have a pretty big presence globally in eventing we're kind of we're kind of a big deal I think people know about us we're a big deal we don't win medals but we're a big deal <laughs> that is true we are we don't win medals but we are a big deal he had a bunch of key recommendations that were super important after he went through this analysis. So some of those included that they needed to improve the, ask, the way that data is collected. He really wants jump judges, fence judges to wear GoPros so that they can document every rider and that the FBI then can take those memory cards specifically when there's a fall and review it. It's fine. It's a lot of GoPros, but I think that's an interesting idea. He also recommended things like making sure that everybody knows about this report, which is really interesting because one of his big concerns was making sure that the findings of this like 100 page document got out there and into the world. And the news media I found covering it really focused on the wrong parts. And I was like, I hope Charles is mad because this is not what he asked. He did not want it to happen like this. They really focused on things like the establishment of a working party to consider radical and shortened versions of the sport to enhance public engagement and produce results of competition in real time. <laughs> I don't think that's what he wanted to focus on. No, I mean, it's one of his ideas. He wrote that down, but I think this whole report is around like the safety of eventing and like where those risks on course are and media really focused on like shortening eventing and making sure that there's an easy way for spectators to follow the sport by proper branding of the riders and a means of identifying relative positions of the riders at each stage of the competition those are some of his suggestions but if you read the report like those are really like 
That's not the meat and potatoes. Those are just some ideas. Also, not really sure how that plays into the safety of the sport. I mean, I guess more people watching, they want to be safer. So we don't really I mean, that we don't does care about go, the safety until people are watching. Knowing that those were key takeaways from a safety study does make me wonder what were the true parameters of this study by FEI. Yeah. If our conclusion is that the sport needs to be radically altered so that people can get scores in real time, the general public can get scores in real time, what was the real, like, question? Because if you said this was a safety analysis, that makes no sense. Right, that has nothing to do with safety. Right, that has nothing to do with safety. Making sure riders have little, like, computerized flags on them so you can follow them around a cross-country course like that makes no sense (laughs) so one of the things that I don't fully understand I kind of understand it is the uh, rider categorization so there is a rider categorization system all riders are either categorized or uncategorized if you are in category A that means you are a top level professional probably competing on the United States team and you kind of work your way down to D level riders as well as uncategorized and this is important because that's what comes up when we're talking about which events are more dangerous and to who they are more dangerous for um so some of the things he pointed out about this rider categorization system so this rider categorization system is kind of how the up-and-coming riders are identified it's like you have to climb this ladder. You don't just get to move to the next category because you've been showing or because you have a horse. You have to like meet some MERS and some qualification standards to do that. So he has pointed out or riders have pointed out to him that this system can hinder a rider with one good horse climbing up the ladder. In order to get the necessary qualifications to progress, there is some evidence that combinations may take part in too many events and overface a horse. Having said this, it is better to err on the side of safety and keep a strict qualification system. If a rider is good enough, they should be able to get more horses to ride and thereby improve. So part of the push, and I just thought this was interesting, again, really had nothing to do with safety, but maybe, is that there is a belief that you need more horses. If you want to be taken seriously and you want to be considered a higher categorized rider, you have to get earn those points by having more horses. I just think that's an interesting, becoming a professional rider or becoming a team rider is the more horses, the better. And I think we've seen this. Oh, I definitely think we've seen this. I honestly, I've been very, this is something I've always kind of disliked when it comes to upper level riders is almost the requirement for them to have a conveyor belt like system to be constantly taking in horses and flipping them around and turning them around and having like a whole string of horses because Riders now are starting to get horses later and later in their training process where previously riders were getting horses when they're a lot greener, when the venting was mostly with off the track thoroughbreds, they're getting off the track thoroughbreds and training them kind of from the ground up. But now that we've seen the market has really switched over to importing horses, there's riders getting horses a lot farther along in their journey that horses have already competed at the one star or two star level before they come over to that top rider. And I think they've kind of had a breakdown in that relationship that develops while a rider brings a horse along from their greener stages up the levels versus like, you know, getting a horse that's farther along in their training. I think there's a disconnect in that relationship between both horse and rider. Which is interesting because if you look at that Irish study, which I didn't go through very, like I didn't pull that one out in depth because this is such, this is like a hundred pages I read every page of for this FEI audit. And I thought (laughs) like I wanted to focus on it and not all these studies, but that Irish study I didn't keep in because it pointed out that you have greater risks depending on what phase of the relationship you are in with that horse. So if that horse is moving up versus you moving up versus a brand new partner. So there are risks associated with how new that horse is to you. And the fact that part of the structure of FEI and what FEI is encouraging the national federations to do is get more horses, more, 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 more. We need riders to have more horses if they want to be considered for the team or to get enough points to qualify to be a higher categorized rider. I also thought it was really interesting that Charles pointed out, and again, this is just in his list of recommendations and key takeaways. I do think there's a lot of stuff in that study that weren't published that I didn't have access to. 
on purpose because to come to some of these conclusions, I don't know how we're coming to some of these conclusions. But one of them was that it is not the FEI's responsibility to assist national federations in developing developing riders. It is not the FEI's job to participate in uh, helping riders in other countries to help each nation develop a team. I thought that was really interesting. And he agrees that the FEI, their current view on not assisting is correct. But I don't know that that's actually as true as it's worded. You know what I mean? Like, I think these are yeah. organizations are a lot more intertwined than maybe they say they are. I digress. This is, has nothing to do with safety. It was just all in that audit. And I thought it was interesting because the audit was all about safety. That was all that he was commissioned to do. So I don't know why he's going off on these tangents. He set up out looking at data between 2008 and 2014. He put a bunch of variables together. He's got lots of tables, lots of graphs. He did some regression modeling. He increased and decreased in these independent variables. And he did he did his thing with the stats and stuff. And I wish I understood stats because, because I think it could be really useful. They had all sorts of questions that they were looking at trying to answer and look at these variables. Variables ranged from course designers. Again, they're only looking at start events. So one, two, or three, four, because that's FEI. Uh, you know, did the competition, CIC versus CCI have effect, fence types, uh, combination. They looked at frangible fences and portable fences, specifically approach terrain, landing terrain. You know, did the horse hit the fence hard? Did the uh, portable tip over? Did the fence break? Did the horse somersault? Did the rider misjudge the situation? Was the athlete inexperienced? Was the athlete distracted, fatigued, horse out of control, too fast, too slow, jump into shadow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they had a ton of variables that they were looking at and were putting into their equations. In total, between 2008 and 2014, they looked at 113,000 different jumps. Well, that's a large number. Yeah. Of that, they had fences where more than one horse fell was 1,572. And the number of falls that they analyzed was 1,689. So what they found was the most, the fences that you were most likely to fall off at were post and rail, uh, a square spread, which was like a table, a corner, and a step jump. Those were the four that you were most likely to fall off on. The safest four was an ascending spread, so like a just regular looking oxer. A brush fence was number two, or one of the four. A round fence was also one, and a ditch was number four. I do think it's really interesting to point out that most of the senior riders he interviewed, and he kept this, he put this in, and I think it's an interesting little statement, especially when you look through study or this audit, is that most senior riders believe if I fall, it was my fault, not the horses. And he points out that uh, that's actually not necessarily the case. Like it's not that it's the horse's fault, but it may not be the rider's fault either. It could be a lot of these other factors that are contributing to the course and to like whether you're likely to fall or not. A couple other interesting things. You are more likely to fall at a championship event than you are at any other. But this likely has to do with like the type of pressure that could be on you and that it's often like a reduced number. It's not like the biggest horse show available, but that it's like a reduced number of riders that are there with a lot of pressure on them and that it has like a higher status. So you're more likely to fall off at a championship. He did note that in Germany, that their training program is likely the better one because you are less likely to fall off at the one and two star level in Germany than you are in any other country. Well, Yahoo for Germany. Go Germany. Because I think like, is it the one star or two star level? One of those is super dangerous if you are a male. Like males are making the two star level extremely dangerous. Oh, that's weird. I don't like that. Yeah, males be weird. They be messing up those numbers. Okay, so he found overall that decreased risks of falling off included an ascending spread and land with a jump with an uphill landing. Things that were likely to increase the risk of falling off was the event that you were competing at, four star being the highest, but you are more likely to fall off or if you are an uncategorized or lower quality rider at the four star event. So if you are an A categorized rider, you're less likely to fall off. Four stars have the most people falling off. I think it's just like people not being prepared, not having horses that are fully ready. Like it, it makes sense. But you have to make sure that you're when you're thinking of four stars as being the ones where most people fall, 
you have to keep in mind who is falling. Right. I think that also goes back to that statistic that it, of uh, riders moving up a level are more likely to fall off. And especially because four stars are not the most common event around, right? You only have a yeah. handful scattered across several different countries that you're going to have a fair amount of new riders trying to try their hand at four star events. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting to also add on top of that, that those riders who are uncategorized also are the ones with only one horse. So does only having one horse, is that a hindrance or is it not a hindrance? Okay, so again, some of these other factors that are going to lead to things like rotational falls. You're more likely to have a rotational fall if your horse hits the jump really hard on the way up on takeoff. That kind of makes sense. If the athlete misjudged the situation, that also leads to a lot of falls. If you are going too fast or too slow and you're most likely to fall off at a post and rail fence and have a rotational or a palisade, which a palisade, uh, because I didn't know what that was, it's like a ramp. But like a really, usually it's not a very ramped ramp. So typically what you're seeing is like, think about you're coming down a hill and you do that tiny little, uh, the skinny. The skinny is that little triangle ramp. The chevron? Yeah, the chevron. (laughs) Thank you. I knew there was a different word for that, a chevron. So before I pass it over to you, um, because there's a lot, like I could go through this list all day about what's more risky, what's less risky. Something interesting that they did find is they looked at frangible technology. There was a greater likelihood of horse falls at fences that were fitted with frangible devices than at those without. However, this could be a direct effect of the type of fences that have frangible as they are typically your post and rail. Most judges said the fence did not break. In 94% of the falls, horse falls, the frangible device did not activate. Therefore, he is concerned, he did leave with some concerns that frangible technology was not reducing falls or rotational falls as it was designed to, but that it needs to be more we like heavily looked into. Um, and that's where I'll kind of leave our falling, why you fall. So there's a lot of different studies out there. Some of them want to blame the jump that it's like, I found one study that I did read a couple times, but didn't, didn't understand. They kept saying that like cross country is only dangerous because there's jumps. Horses don't fall on the other part of the cross country course. Like they're not falling when they're away from jumps. They just fall (laughs) at the jumps. Therefore it's the jump. And I was like, no duh. Yeah, no, we all have agreed on that part. So thank you so much. But it's not like the jump is like, you know, attacking the horse. So there is not a ton of research, but it all seems to indicate the same thing, that the course designers really have to understand all of these combinations and really have to understand where are the high-risk fences, where are the low-risk fences, what's the high-risk footing, the low-risk footing, how does terrain. Like, it's a very complicated course designing process if you want to reduce the risk of falling as much as possible. It's not just frangible pins. It's not just one little piece of this. It's all, there's a lot to it. With that, I will hand it to you, Robin. Do you want to talk to us about the frangible pins? But actually, I do have a real quick question before I get into it. That study, the audit that you're just talking about, what year was that done in? So this was published in 2016. He was contracted in 2015. Oh, okay. And he looked at data between 2008 and 2014. That's actually really interesting because I feel like, I wonder what his conclusions would have been following 2015, 2016. Because I know that was a year that we had another, a lot of deaths in eventing. That was a big year for... There was like five or six that died. So what's interesting, good catch, good catch, good catch, because there was also a big spike in 2007 as well. So he's he said the reason he chose those years was because that was all the data that was available, that FEI was not keeping records very well. But then you wonder how independent was he, right? Because if you're hiring someone to do an internal audit and he was hired because he is a racehorse expert, Charles Barnett does the racehorse stuff. And so he's not an insider. He's approaching this as an outsider and I'm using air quotes. I just wonder like the FBI has no reason to hire someone who isn't going to act in their best interest. Not saying that's what they did. Not saying that's what they did. But it does make you wonder what was the context, especially when you're coming up with a bunch of conclusions that weren't like, I don't know how you got there and why you're so concerned with TV. Right. Like why you, why so many conclusions had to deal with things that didn't actually pertain to safety in eventing. Very confusing. 
But now I would like to take all of you guys and gals, non-binary pals, on an adventure, a journey to look at frangible pins. And we'll start off with a brief glance back at history, if you will. Our journey is we're going to start back about 20 years ago in 2001, where there was once again a large number of deaths and eventing. And for those of you that keep track of years and numbers, it was just a little bit after 1999. Oh, 2000 was after 99? Yeah, 2001. It was just like three years after 1999. But we had a large number of deaths in 1999, a large number of deaths in 2001, that eventually FBI was like, okay, we got to do something about this. And so they commissioned Transport Research Laboratory in the UK to look into different ways to reduce the risk of rotational falls. And this is where I think starting to um, separate the types of falls that we're talking about is really what FBI is looking into and at frangible pins and deformable, I always mess up this word, deformable fences are for is to reduce rotational falls. It's not to reduce riders falling off necessarily. It's great if they don't. It's also not to reduce necessarily horses falling. It's to reduce that rotational fall that is known to have a lot higher, I think like 30% higher risk of serious injury to horses and like 10% greater risk of serious injury to riders. Correct, because your chances of getting smushed are much greater. Yeah, you got that rear end coming straight for your dome. And originally, they actually, when they were looking at frangible pin technology, they were originally only testing uh, vertical forces, not horizontal ones, which I thought was really interesting because if I've ever seen a horse crash into a fence, it's generally been horizontally, not coming down from above. However, like them only looking at vertical forces led to the production of the forward-facing frangible pin by British Aventing. The only real downside with this pin was the fact that they only took into account vertical forces. So... With how a rotational fall occurs, the horse kind of uses the jump or the jump acts as a fulcrum point. And so with only taking into account vertical forces, the horse has to already be in rotation for that pin to break, activating the frangible technology, which doesn't really reduce rotational falls that much if the horse has to be in rotation to activate it. I guess the idea would be to make the rotational fall less rotationally, less somersaulty. Instead of getting a 360, you only get a like a 180. I I guess I don't I don't actually fully know on that one. But in 2009, research by Mats Bjornatin and Anders Flogard of Mim Construction, they were like, hey, actually, when a horse is colliding with a jump and you have a rotational fall happening, there's horizontal forces at play that you have to be taking into account. And so they started brainstorming different ideas for frangible technology. But MIMS, but MIMS is the technology that's used on tables. And as we discussed earlier, you're less likely to have a rotational fall at a table than you are at a the ones with the frangible. I'm just pointing that out. Not that, not to like, I'm just, I've just said, a, I just, they, they swooped in where they weren't needed is what I'm saying. Well, no, I, no. See, I, no, I don't really think that's necessarily true because MIMS technology, they have more than just oh, okay. more than just the table. They have their own clips as well. There's multiple types of frangible technology out there. We'll get to it. Hang on. Yeah, yeah, no. I know, I know, I know that they have to have like a certain percentage that our MIMS are collapsible. Something like that. Hang on. I'll get into it. Shush your face. Anyways, when Mats Bjornatin and Anders Flogard were doing research on this frangible technology back in 2009, they are a part of MIMS Construction AB, and they are one of the main producers of crash-tested cargo separator safety nets, and they have experience producing crash zones and controls in loads and like mechanical safety systems. So they have been well known for being testing and manufacturers of safety devices for different cars, which I thought is really interesting because if you go back to the episode that talked about helmets, that kind of came about with uh, motorcycle technology. Yeah. Anyways, though, if you take a look at Matt Bjornatin, he is actually the owner of MIM Construction AB, and he also has a history of being an event director. So that's kind of where his investment and interest in finding frangible technology, developing this technology to help make events safer is he already has this vested interest and has experience within the eventing industry. They showed that when a horse collides with a fence, it is primarily horizontal forces being exerted that led to the rotation part of rotational falls. And it was at this point that the MIMS system, which releases instantly in response to the horizontal forces, was introduced. And if you actually go to FEI, there's only two approved frangible pin systems that you'll ever see on course. Mm -hmm. And that is the British eventing pins 
and the various MIMS systems. And that system includes the MIMS clips and the uh, like table, the deformable table. And because of FEI's close restrictions on these frangible devices, whether it's the clips, the deformable tables, the pins, they actually have several like requirements put in place. What FEI requires them to do is not present a greater and or additional risk than that of a fixed fence. So a log or a rail on that jump can't come off or be detached from the fence if a horse were to hit it. So it can't, you know, continue to fall with the horse and rider presenting another hazard. Yeah. They also have to have a minimum strength of fence without activation to still represent that typical fixed cross-country jump style, which I think is interesting that you mentioned that there was a number of frangible jumps that didn't break when they were hit. Mm -hmm. And these pins, they have to undergo different tests to ensure that even when they're hit by a horse under a certain level of force or weight, that they don't break. That test that the pins have undergone has actually recently been changed. That way it's a little bit less weight, I think is what it is. On top of that is these pins also have to show they can be used repeatedly without showing signs of fatigue if they were to undergo an impact that doesn't trigger them. So while horses obviously are gonna clip the pole or the rail, pin has to not um, deteriorate over time. Makes sense, keep everything fair and equal. So the goal of this technology is to reduce the number of rotational falls. And according to FBI data, the use of deformable technology will not prevent falls. But the way they do this is the frangible and deformable fences work by either removing the fulcrum point on the fence that the horse rotates about, or they limit the force that the fence exerts on the horse. So it gives away before that horse can reach the force needed to somersault somersault themselves over the fence. So yeah, you don't hit it as hard with your chest. Yeah, so essentially it would give away before the horse against the jump can reach that max force no, point. No, that's true. Yeah, you just crumble. So with the FBI standard, the frangible fences must meet two horizontal tests. They go through a worst case testing position, which is the position on the fence where the horse strikes is most likely to activate it. And then they also undergo the most frequent case testing position, which is the position the horse is most likely to hit. Furthermore, these pins have to undergo a pendulum test without activating. And previously, before 2020, the pendulum test that they had to undergo was a mass striking at an angle of negative five to five degrees with a mass of 120 kilograms, which is about 265 pounds. It had to be able to strike the jump without it breaking. But as of March 2020, this rule was amended to them using a 40 kilogram kettlebell, which is about 88 pounds. But they also changed the degree of which the weight was hitting the jump at. Previously, it was around negative five to five degrees where the mass would strike the fence. And they changed it to the mass striking the fence at about 27 degrees. And from there, they pull it back about 1.5 meters, 2 meters, and 2.5 meters and drop it all from those three different heights to strike the fence at 27 degrees with its various weights. I wonder, wait, what year was that that they lowered it? 2020, March 2020. I wonder if that, I mean, has anything to do with what was pointed out in Charles, uh, his audit, right? If they're not break, if they weren't breaking in 2014, then maybe they've realized they need to wait, reduce that testing. I, I think that could have been part of it. I definitely think that could have been part of it because they, you know, now seeing the various frangible pins included on courses they're seeing when they break and when they don't and they're like okay some of these aren't breaking when they're supposed to be we need to change the test that these pins have to meet and part of the reason why there's only two approved um manufacturers out there is because none of the others have been, made, been able to meet the standard of maintaining that fixed fence that everyone wants interesting so there are more like there's more people out there, companies out there trying to... Apparently, but you cannot find their names anywhere. I was reading stuff and they kept mentioning how like multiple brands, multiple companies were bringing their things to be tested. And MIMS was like the first one to pass the test and stuff. And so I was like, oh, it's... I wonder who else is out here trying. I wonder what, like, what is, what are they bringing to the table? But I couldn't find anywhere that mentioned their names. All it talks about is the British Eventing Frangible Pin and... Mim. But regardless of who's doing what, FEI came about with a rule change in regards to cross-country courses and their use of frangible technology back in 2017. July 1st, in 2017, USDA approved a rule change where all fences above training level must employ frangible technology where possible. Fences constructed after September 1st, 2018 must be equipped with appropriate frangible technology, while fences constructed prior to September 1st, 2018 
must be retrofit with the appropriate device by December 1st, 2018. They're trying to get this frangible technology out there on the courses more because really prior to like 2015, 2016, you really weren't seeing very many fences using this or very many event venues using this because they claimed it was too expensive. Right. And so that's why they've been doing all the fundraising efforts recently to get all of the different events to get them these MIMS and frangible pins devices. Because I mean, to the extent they are expensive and I totally get that. And you're going to, I mean, how many jumps do you have on course depending on the different levels? If it's training and above, I mean, that's quite a, that's probably at least like 10 to 20 fences depending on the venue that probably need some type of MIMS at the very least and then the pins as well. And sorry, I keep thinking of MIMS as just being the table kind, but you're saying it's more than just the table kind. It is, because what they fail to mention in this is that FBI excludes tables from this mandate. As of 2020, there is not an approved frangible device for tables. The risk management steering group is like they view that there's not enough evidence to support the table is functioning sufficiently well for a mandatory implement at this stage. Which is just obnoxious because if that's what somebody is fundraising for and not the other type of device, but one of these is required, the fundraising, I get it, but like it's not, you should be fundraising for the other thing. Right, so there are, I know we keep talking about it and I'll address it right now, is that there are a few different style of frangible pins and deformable jumps. And I think what we all think of when we hear a frangible device, frangible pin jump is just those like cylinder pegs that stick out from the backside of the jump that when the horse hits it, those break and the log falls. That's what we all think about. There's actually four different types out there. You have the deformable tables, which is a MIM deformable table, and those take uh, 500 kilograms of force to activate. You also have the British Inventing Reverse Pinning System, and this is preferable to forward pinning and is what we traditionally see and think of when it comes to the frangible pins, where it is that peg on the backside of the jumps that when hit with a certain amount of force, the jump collapses backwards and downwards. That's reverse pins. That's reverse pinning. There's also forward pinning that is not used very often. In fact, probably the only place you're going to see it is on front rail of open corners. Yeah, that makes sense. Due to the nature of how one jumps a corner and how they're built and how the horse would fall against one of those jumps. And corners are super dangerous. They're one of the high risk fences, Uh, especially the open corners. The solid corners are good. The open corners, super dangerous. Exactly. And so that's the only place that you're going to really see front pinning occurring because they need both those rails to come down. And typically the horse isn't going to hit the rails going the exact same direction. So, And then really the fourth type out there is the MIM clip and pin, which I don't know if anyone has seen that on like, it'll you'll typically see it on a post and rail type oxer as well as on walls and open like upright gates. And that is like those little metal clips that fixes on the side of a jump and like hooks the gate essentially to the post holding it up. That's the different types that are out there. But I did read through a study that Anders Flogard did in 2009 called a study of means to prevent rotational falls in cross country eventing. And their goal was to verify the potential of a structural solution that lets cross-country event fences collapse in a controlled way when the risk of a rotational fall is present. They built three different types of test fences with force-limiting devices, frangible and deformable. They measured the forces during impact with the fence, and this was done in a controlled environment using a weight suspended in the air to drop and impact the fence. They had a collapsible gate, They had a table fence and an open post and rail fence. They then implemented these three deformable jump types at an event and recorded with high-speed video instances of activation. That way they were able to take into account more than just their laboratory setting tests and see how it actually interacted in the real world. I guess fortunately or unfortunately, I suppose, they only had one that was activated on that course that they were at. Dang it. And so they only could pull data from one of those. I mean good but also dang it <laughs> I, yeah i know i don't like fortunate but also unfortunate I don't, I don't know i didn't really want more horses to hit it but but what they found was that test results showed potential for limiting the risk of sustaining serious injuries on cross country so when they examined the forces level exerted on stationary gate versus a stationary gate with a deformable piece they noted that forces differentiated from 20 kilonewtons to 8.9 kilonewtons when the fence had a frangible piece to it. They also took notice that when the gate was fixed, 
the forces exerted on it lasted four times as long as when the fence had frangible bits to it. Which makes sense, right? The forces are going to last longer when the jump stays upright versus when the jump like dips to the ground. Another thing that they measured and noted was that the force to slow down the weight dropped when the frangible device was involved was 262 newtons per second. But without a deformable piece, the force that was used to slow the weight was 2,455 newtons per second. I don't know what a newton is, but that it was a big difference. That is a big difference. And then when they were looking at the table fence, it took 471 newtons per second to slow the weight down versus the 2,445 newtons per second. And their maximum force in comparison to the 20 kilonewtons was 13.7. And then when they looked at the post and rail fence, their maximum force that they saw was 12.6 kilonewtons rather than that 20 kilonewtons. And the force exerted to slow the weight down was 536 newtons per second rather than that 2,445 newtons per second with the fixed fences. Okay, can you can you explain this to me like I'm five? So force that the fence had to exert to slow the weight down and before the weight started slowing was significantly less with the frangible devices in place. As well as the maximum force exerted on the fence was significantly less when it was the gate fence it was 8.9 versus 20 kilonewtons so that was significantly less the maximum force that the gate experienced which would be the maximum force the horse is exerting on it so i would assume when the horse is able to reach that maximum force that is what kind of catapults them over the jump in a somersault but when they can't reach that maximum force it's a lot less likely they're going to have that somersault over the jump okay or to land as hard or cause as many injuries or squish their riders right and when it came to the practical test only one horse actually activated the upright gate on course by leaving a knee behind however when the fence dropped and was activated the horse was able to regain their footing and balance and avoid what looked like to be an incoming rotational fall and when i look at the pictures from it The horse definitely left a knee behind and looked scary at first. I was grateful that there was the fence broke and they were able to regain their footing because I don't think that necessarily would have happened if the fence had remained upright and stationary. However, the only caveat with this is that, of course, this was done by Anders Flogard, who helped develop the MIM technology and is a consultant for MIM. Right, so he's got a point to prove. Yeah, he definitely had a point to prove. And I think that should definitely be taken into consideration when you read through his study. However, Eventing Nation did a really good article back in 2014 that looked at badminton that year and evaluated uh, jumps that had frangible technology with them and used frangible pins. And it looked at those horses that activated those pins on various jumps throughout. And they went through a list and were like, did these pins actually help save horses from serious injuries? Did they actually do what they're advertised to do? And I think there was more than one scenario where I would say it did stop a horse from hitting a rotational fall. And Eventing Nation, the author of the article, kind of agree with that. There was certainly one instance where one of the horses was coming up to a big open-faced oxer and split their front legs over the back rail. And because their frangible technology, the rail broke and they just kind of crumbled to their knees, where I think if it had stayed upright, that horse definitely would have had a rotational fall. So while that study is skewed in Anders Flogard's favor, I still think it has a point. Yeah, okay. Good. That they're working somewhere. Right, and I think in this instance, you know how we always talk, like products that are advertised to the vast majority out there aren't suited for every single horse and rider combination, so why is it advertising to everybody? But I think this is one of those products that if it saves just one horse from a rotational fall... I think they've done their job. No, I mean, I think any I think any improvement to the safety on the cross-country course is great. I just wonder if we're going to see, like, what change comes next? Because we changed the nature of the courses, right? Our courses are a lot more technical now. I think that technicality aspect, cross-country carrying a lot more weight, seems to have triggered these falls. I think you're seeing these technical fences, like a combination. You're more likely to have a fall on part B than on a jump that isn't part of a combination like all these spots where that fall is being increased it just i don't want if we reduce that risk of fall then what happens next you know, like how do you continue to dif- differentiate out winners and losers yeah i get that honestly i think our biggest problem is not like the solidity of our jumps i think it's inexperienced riders taking too many risks at these various levels and it's riders yeah. tackling courses 
way beyond their skill levels. So when I talk about how I think frangible pins are definitely needed, but it's more of it addresses the symptoms and not the cause, I think the cause is addressing these inexperienced riders that are riding at this level, right? And of course, at some point, someone is not going to have ridden at that level before and to get to the next level, you have to ride at it. But when we were looking at minimum eligibility requirements, the MERS, there could be a change that made it a little bit more challenging. And I, I'm very frustrated and annoyed with USEA, FEI, those guys, when they were looking at the last couple months changing the minimum eligibility requirements, it felt very much like a toddler that was told no. And so they stormed off to the room and slammed the door. I was like, fine, then how about this? And like handed you a list of minimal requirements that no one was going to be able to meet without absolutely ruining their horse. Yeah. And certain riders in certain areas were never going to be able to meet that number of events. So like it was very much so it feels like an overreaction and like they weren't actually willing to compromise because now everyone was immediately like, no, that's not going to work. And so they're like, okay, then what do you want? And they just kind of threw it out and are going to ignore it till the next meeting that rolls around. Yeah, I think it's, to me, I think the biggest issue with cross country, now that it's more technical, goes back to that sort of that resource management aspect. As someone who has a small, small, small obsession with plane crashes, um, (laughs) there is a lot of, discussion about how resource how managing the resources things got stressful and things started to get missed in that cockpit things that shouldn't have been missed you know you're going through when you fly a plane it's a checklist of things you go through and you have to continue to work through this checklist and when people are getting stressed out they're nervous they're sleep deprived they're a b and c they start to miss little things they never would have missed before And I think that is very realistic of what happens on cross country is it's a big flood of adrenaline. There's so much going on. You want to win or you want to get around clean or X, Y, Z. And that's you just focus on this narrow little goal instead of sort of just sitting up and thinking through the entire course. And I, I know that's easier said than done, but I think... If you don't have enough practice and experience at a lower level, you oftentimes find yourself in these situations and it's just like, I have no idea how I get out of this. And with the rise of the prelim packer, the one star packer, the two star packer, that rider has to think a lot less. Um, You know, those packers absolutely have a place because they give you that confidence and teach you what it should feel like. But then they also leave this huge hole where you never had to think your way around a course. you got to just sit there around a course. And so I think there's just this huge need for riders to more than 46 percent of riders to take cross country lessons for there to be a change on how we approach cross country as a whole. And that this if it's going to be as big. You know, it, it really is one third of your score. You know, if you can't get around cross country clean, then you're not going to win. So how do you spend more time to be more successful on cross country? How do you invest in that as a rider? And I mean, then we have a whole issue with, you know, we need more course designers. We need better educated uh ground juries we need better educated technical delegates one of the recommendations in that audit was that these actually need to be paid positions so people can be get have careers where they are technical delegates where they can you know commit to this sport and be better educated probably making it a career is also probably a problem as well but i think you know there's just education was for all of those people who are involved with hosting an event and putting it on was a big emphasis of that 2015 audit. All right, guys. Well, on that note, thank you so much for listening to us all the way through this episode. We really appreciate you. If you guys have any comments, questions, concerns, topics you want us to discuss, things just on your mind, you can always reach out to us on Instagram at inthebarn.pod or you can send us an email at inthebarn, in the barn in the barn pod at gmail.com yeah thanks for listening